actually kind of going to be a good follow-on to Cheryl's just now because the research that I've been doing for one of my clients, uh, the Internet Safety Labs, is actually developing a framework for us to really identify the underlying structures um, that our patterns that we're creating in our user interfaces connect with um, to ensure or to prevent uh, data from being shared uh, in inappropriately. Uh, so we're going to be talking about uh, preventing digital harm. Um, and I'm also an academic, so I kind of like to be really close to my, my speaker notes um, and very comfortable here. Um, our talk uh, today is really about relationships as much as it is about design patterns. Um, it's about the little bits of digital stuff that we kind of shed off and trickle out whenever we use a digital product. Um, anything that you use, anything that touches us, um, has some kind of underlying conversation between what the world knows about our data that's already out there and what, the, um, what we're actually consciously sharing uh, through the system. Um, and whether you know it or not, you have a relationship um, that is uh, legal relationships in a lot of um, aspects that you've consented to, possibly implicitly, um, but it definitely exists between all of these things that you're, um, that you're working with as a, as a uh, product user. So when I originally proposed this talk, I was actually going to be talking about the metaverse. Um, but the metaverse didn't really turn into anything, right? Um, and <laughs> you know, we, we still are actually immersed in a lot of this data that's all around us. So it's almost as though we are you know, physically walking through a metaverse of data um, that we don't really know is already out there about us. And we're sharing information, we're sharing you know, the things that we do and the things that we like and who we talk to. Um, so even though we're not living in this cartoon space, it's something that we um, should really be uh, talking about as designers. Because you do have influence um, and you do, are, um, you do have some risk involved in the products that you're creating and even some possible culpability. Um, this talk isn't really about what designers do wrong. I want to try to be positive at the end. Um, we're pattern makers, but we're also people, and we're affected by these same things. Um, and uh, we interact probably a lot more online than a lot of people do. If you think about how often you spend you know, on some kind of digital program or device um, compared to some of the other people that you know in your family or in your career, um, you might find that you're actually a lot more engaged with and have a lot more relationships with these different kinds of technologies. Um, at Internet Safety Labs, we're, just, uh, we're studying these relationships. Um, and we want to answer questions like, what kind of relationship do you have with your technology? And the answer is, people actually do feel that they have a relationship with their technology. And it's not just the embodied cognition of having the phone that tells you when to wake up because the conference is about to start, right? It's like a physical, you, you, if your phone, if you leave it behind, my iPad, is back in the um, hotel, and I feel it. I feel that I don't have that device with me, and it's, um, it's kind of disturbing. Um, <laughs> we also ask whether they understand the full extent of the relationship that they have with their technology um, and the choices that they're making when they explore and enter into relationships and even when they dissolve or forget to or just don't bother to dissolve these relationships. Um, so we've heard this mantra before, do no harm. It's a big part of the medical industry. Um, do no harm, from the Hippocratic Oath to Isaac Asimov's robotics laws. Uh, we don't want to hurt people, right? Um, I want us to take a closer look at digital harms and the design patterns that can um, lead to harm. Uh, and uh, when we talk about these things that are called dark patterns, and I'm going to unpack that a little bit in a bit, um, what are they and how do they affect uh, people um, and who do they touch? Um, what we can do is try to ensure that these patterns don't create and perpetuate suffering in the world. Um, and I also want to be controversial uh, about this concept of being dark. Uh, the Internet Safety Labs has been um, using the term um, harmful UI patterns 
to really kind of focus on the outcome, like what is really happening um, that is an outcome that can be corrected. Um, DARC has a lot of loaded, um, you know, colonialism issues with if you're, if you're, if something is dark, it must be bad, you know, that we have to shed light on things. Um, and we try to want to step back from that a little bit. But also, when you think about dark patterns, you think about it being deceptive and manipulative and very deliberate. Um, and it's not always deliberate. Sometimes it's really built into the um, legacy systems that we're putting together. It's built into the things that we're trying to integrate into our products that maybe we haven't really examined very deeply. Um, so, you know, if you're in that, um, you know, the first talk was talking about being in that fast culture, sometimes you just want to snap something together so that you have something to show and you don't really realize that you've actually made, um, exposed your uh, audience to patterns that might um, actually harm them. Um, so uh, I took a look at the three laws of robotics from Isaac Asimov and I kind of revised them for UX designers. Um, so that that first law that the designer may not injure a human being um, through their inaction, which might be, you know, not examining some of these underlying um, assumptions that we have about our users or these underlying technologies that we're, um, that we're, you know, snapping together, you know, in order to get that product out. Um, they, sh they still have to, you know, work. They still have a client. They still have a boss. They still have, you know, deadlines to meet. So we have to kind of balance that a little bit with, you know, getting, uh, you know, the product out the door. Um, but you also have to be kind to yourself. You have to make sure that you are not creating a um, product or creating a situation on your team that is uncomfortable, that's going to make you feel like, oh my God, I just created this thing that is hurting people. Um, but there's always going to be harm. That's just kind of, you know, the whole idea of Dharma in Buddhism. It's, it, harm just exists. You know, we are humans. We live on a planet. Um, there, it's, it's, you know, it's uh, kind of scary out there sometimes. Um, but uh, what I did is I also took a look at that Dharma and I kind of reformulated them uh, also for digital harm. So there is digital harm um, and there, uh, you know, it's all around us. Uh, we live in it, we create it, um, and we also can help to, um, you know, uh, minimize it. Uh, so let's go back to this idea of dark patterns. Um, feelings, our feelings are exploited uh, by what are sometimes called dark patterns, and our actions are exploited as well. Um, they tend to um, leverage a lot of our um, unconscious cognitive biases um, toward, you know, doing, you know, uh, you know, trying to get through the task quickly. If it's something that we have to do quickly, you might not be really thinking about what you're doing or you just want the convenience of being able to just start. Um, I want to take a little look at the history of dark patterns. Um, and again, I want us to kind of think about this in this framework. Let's not think about dark patterns as something that is deceptive. And I know that Harry Brignall, who was the original darkpatterns.org, um, has also kind of gone around from the dark patterns idea to more deceptive design. Um, his uh, his uh, website is now called deceptive.design. Um, but I also want to say, you know, let's, let's even think about those, those kinds of patterns that we're creating that aren't in intentionally deceptive. Um, so what are some of these kinds of dark patterns? These are things that you've seen before. Um, they're tricks. Uh, Harry Brignell says that they are tricks used in websites and apps that make you do things that you didn't mean to, uh, like buying or signing up for something. Um, and I would say also like uh, agreeing to cookies. We've all had that for the past several years already now. Um, uh, and uh, we want to identify these different kinds of behaviors that technologies make that can create negative outcomes for the, use, uh, the user. So uh, there's a ton of them. I'm going to walk through just a couple. Um, this one has a colorful name. Um, it's from the way that Facebook encourages you to give up as much information ab about you as possible by, by making things engaging. And of course, we had issues with, um, you know, uh, Cambridge Analytica trying to get you involved in these fun little quizzes. You know, what kind of dog are you? Um, and they're actually finding a lot of information that you're giving, um, uh, you know, 
willingly. Um, and another one is something called a Roche Motel, and this predates digital. Roche Motel is basically you get into um, a, a situation that you can't get out of, you find out that you've signed up for a, um, a subscription at a company, a magazine, an account, um, and it's impossible for you to get out of it. Uh, and that's what the Roach Motel is. Um, it could be annoying and upsetting and emotional. Um, so it's kind of like this is a negative relationship that you might have if there is a product that you're using that um, has this kind of feeling of control over your participation. Uh, trick questions. This is GDPR all over the place. Um, you know, every time, and I don't know if anybody's ever seen this Stevie Martin um, uh, video. It's on Twitter, uh, where she's just trying to. It's it's she's just trying to find a cookie recipe, and she has to go through all of these cookies um, in order to, you know, decide whether she wants to see the recipe or not. And it takes forever. Um, she's hilarious. If you uh, have a chance to look at it. Um, it's a deceptive pattern. You're primed to answer a certain way, but they make that button so attractive. Let's just get in there. Um, some types of uh, other types of pers uh, harmful patterns are listed here. Um, these are pretty. These are the pretty common ones. There's also some that um, are further subdivided. Purdue University did a really good study where they took a lot of the categories that Harry Bricknell. Um, had for dark patterns and they completely subdivided them so that you can really tackle and understand you know, how this is happening in our interfaces. Um, why do these patterns stick? Um, it's because we want things. Deceptive patterns get you lots of stuff, right? So you wanna buy stuff because you wanna be popular, you wanna have what other people don't have, you wanna get free content, um, you don't want to have to worry about things. You want your experiences to be seamless. Um, but it's deceptive. We're presented with a deal, and we really want to feel like we um, you know, want to get something for what we're giving. Um, and we also are really looking for a good story. We just like really want that story. Um, and you know, maybe you'll submit some of your friends' emails because that'll get you a nice discount, right? Um, but how do your friends feel about that? Um, these technology behaviors have consequences, um, and some of the experiences are a little too new or too intense um, that they do overwhelm our ability to kind of sift through our cognitive biases and understand and react um, to them. Uh, just this week, the US Surgeon General <coughs> warned about these effects. Um, and it's not like we didn't already know about this, but it is a high-level government official acknowledging it, um, and that's a good start. Um, and some of the good news is that the New York Times did an interview of, of students in uh, New York City, um, and they're aware of it. They know what to look for, they know what to stop doing, they know when to not share and when to share, um, and they don't share passwords like they used to back in you know the early days of the social media. And they don't want us to take it away. They don't want it to be over-regulated by the government so that you, if you're a certain age, you can't have access, right? So I think that they're already thinking about this and they're already judging us and what we design. Um, so some of the work that we're doing at the um, Internet Safety Labs is we're developing a dictionary of digital harms. Um, and I've highlighted in red some of the things that I think you've probably seen before um, that are very, uh, very uh, familiar to you, like the physical track, uh, tracking, facial recognition without a consent, um, you know, any kind of manipulation and bias in the way that um, content is filtered and delivered to um, individuals. Um, and we discuss this in this kind of framework of respect, like are we respecting the people who are using our product? Um, it's very personal. Um, we did a lot of research where we talked with um, people who use technology from all over, um, actually all over the US. We stuck with the US population for this study, um, in, in part because we were really addressing the new um, laws that are coming up. US is kind of like 50 different countries when it comes to privacy law. Each state actually has their own or is developing their own. Um, and California right now has the strongest and the most strict one. So a lot of um, what's happening is people are balancing the, 
off of, you know, we want to be able to sell our products to people in California. We want California users. Um, but we also want to have some kind of free business openness, you know, so how do you balance that? Um, but people are really finding that they have this really close personal relationship with their phone, with their email, um, with the shopping that they do. To hear people talk about their, you know, Peloton app um, or to talk about their Etsy account, um, they're, they're like, it's this kind of loyalty that's pretty, um, pretty interesting to really unpack um, when you talk about it. Um, but think about what would happen if you went into a store and they already knew everything about you and what you just ordered. It might feel a little bit convenient, but then they start asking you about your relationship and your, and your kids' grades and, you know, you, they know all of this stuff about you. Wouldn't that be kind of weird? What if they asked you before they would pour a coffee for you to give you five emails from their friends and to tell you their phone number and, oh, oh what's your gender? That's a hot one right now, right? Um, that would be very disturbing. We wouldn't accept that in a social situation in front of another person, but why do we accept that from our technology? Um, I did do a research study um, about loyalty programs, and there was an onboarding flow for the loyalty program. First, you signed up for a newsletter. Um, what do you need for a newsletter? Anybody? An email, right? They want your email, they want your name, they want your zip code, they want your gender, they want your age. You know, some of it's required, a lot of it's not required, but it's all there. And I'm like, well, why do you need all of this information? It should just be an email. Then we looked at the loyalty form. Again, email, name, address, closest store, <laughs> gender. I was like, why do you need gender for a loyalty program? And it was deep in the system. There was something that got patched together way below the surface of the website that had a pivot on gender. And I was like, you gotta change that. You don't need our gender. And a lot of people have genders that don't actually fit the description that you are pivoting from. So after all this, I'm going to say something unexpected, uh, given all this bad stuff. This is a happy picture. Um, this is our goal as a digital creator um, is uh, to develop this trust so that people can continue to have a relationship with their technology and with the things that you're designing um, and feel positive about it because then they'll come back, right? Um, I don't think most of you deliberately want to hurt anyone, right? Um, algorithm algorithmic bias, again, can be very deep in the system and you need to have strategies to unpack that. Um, we often use something because it's a tool, it works, we've used it before. Um, we don't consider what's lurking under there, uh, but we need to identify some people who have a responsibility for ensuring that when you put a plug-in from WordPress into the app, um, into the website, you know, do you really understand the third-party relationships that you are creating for your, for your users? Um, and how can we turn this relationship around and make things better for the people? Um, who use technology and for the businesses and designers. Um, the Safe Tech specification at Internet Safety Labs is a framework that's working on this. Um, they're they're um, hoping to show technical creators how to bring the business and the consumer relationship into balance. Uh, we don't often understand the inc interconnections, we do feel them. Um, part of this is because the relationships are, are very deeply layered. And for all of these relationships to be respectful, you need to follow some basic rules of engagement. Um, so here's an example where you have a relationship with a product, which is a mobile device that we use to connect to the internet. And in this example, it's an Apple phone. Um, and so we have this experiential relationship with our Apple phone, right? Um, we have a relationship with that product and we also have a legal relationship with Apple, the company. So there's two relationships here. Um, there's more, there's hidden relationships with Apple's partners um, and the providers of the software services that help make the app on the phone work, um, your telecom company as well. That's another one, often one of those relationships that are really easy to get into and hard to get out of. Um, another, rela uh, another layer in this example is the browser, um, your native app framework that you connect through. So if you're using a Chrome browser, you have a relationship um, with Chrome and Google. 
a legal relationship with Google and any of their third-party networks, um, which includes some massive advertising networks. Um, and we're using shorthand to describe these relationships. So if you ever see the word me to be, it's basically flipping the B to C um, so that the consumer comes first. Me, I'm the technology user, B is the technology. Um, and uh, we also talk a little bit about me to P, so me to the product, um, the iPhone and the Chrome, um, and me to T, which is all of those under underlying technologies that make it all work. Um, so let's go even deeper into this system. Um, we're using Instagram now on our iPhone. So we've got more relationships. Um, we have this underlying legal, experiential, and technology-enabling relationships um, to, to see what our friends are doing. This is all so we can see what our friends are doing, right? The pictures that you just took of that amazing view out there, this is all happening all behind that. Um, and there's a lot of touch points underlying these third-party integrations that come with their own data agreements and may only be generally described in the privacy policy. How many people here read privacy policies end-to-end -end for everything that they sign up for? I don't see a single hand being raised. I read them. I do. I read them. Not all the time, but I there are some products that I'm really curious about. What are you doing with my data? Who are you sharing my data with, right? Um, and I found um, early on when Slack was starting to be the big thing, it was before they were bought, um, I found that in the privacy policy, they will keep your data private until they sell it to somebody. Then there's no guarantee of what's gonna happen with your data. Guess who bought it? Microsoft, they've got your data. Um, and they went ahead and they had, you know, privacy policy that was okay. <laughs> I was fine with it, but I was a little worried about that. It's like there are people who are sharing a lot of information through these um, systems. Uh, a lot of times very personal information or proprietary information. Um, and you want to make sure that you know who actually has access to it um, and whether your name or your identity in some, some way is attached to it. Um, and we, in order to explain this to consumers, we used George Levenger's relationship model, um, which kind of starts off with this acquaintance. You get to know somebody. Um, there's a little bit of a buildup before you actually um, join a service or create an account. Um, and there might be different levels of joining. That newsletter is one level. Um, the loyalty card might be another level before you're actually you know, completely committed. Um, and, you know, most companies would like to remain in that relationship forever, right? Um, but then there might be some deterioration and you may eventually terminate your account. Um, and we talked about how the level of data sharing changes over the relationship. And in this diagram, it's kind of like the assumed level of information. Um, they might have had a little bit of information about us beforehand because how else are they gonna send us the promotional advertisement, right? Um, so there may be some kind of data network that they're involved in that they get information about people who are likely to buy our product, so we're gonna send you an email and hope you, hope you sign up. Um, and then we also assume that if it deteriorates, you're gonna be using it less, so there's a lot less data that's being exchanged, and eventually there's gonna be no data. Does, does everybody understand and believe that this is actually what's happening? Who thinks this is actually, well, I'm, I'm leading you a little bit, I apologize. Um, this is actually what's happening. Um, your data is already out there. <laughs> there are so many um, you know, data sharing commitments that are buried in all of these different systems. Um, and like I said, a lot of them are things that you consented to because you don't read privacy policies and they say any third party. Um, I know GDPR, you now have to list out the third parties and that can be its own headache. Um, I was trying to read an article in a Scottish newspaper once and in order to read it without any cookies, I had to manually deselect 300 um, trackers. There was no other way. Um, so I didn't read that article. <laughs> um, it's kind of like a, uh, it's kind of like gossip to kind of like bring it back to human terms. Um, and this is also a way that you can describe it with your users if you want to do some of this um, experiment and you know, conversations with your users about it. 
Um, the culprit in this tsunami of unwitting information sharing is the digital advertising infrastructure. Um, and that's why a lot of the laws are centering around what advertisers can and can't do with our data. Um, in particular, personally identifiable data, that's the PII um, that's uh, described by the purple. Um, and uh, yeah, the multiple third parties are, are known as data processors, um, and they are um, they're sharing your data. And as long as this infrastructure ex exists, um, personal data can get um, identified and re-identified um, in this uh, massive, massive collection of data that's out there. Um, so we, we ask questions, you know, like this idea that, you know, I close my account and then, you know, the faucet's off, no more data, right? Um, and people, they don't, they don't think that, actually. They're like, they know. They know, that they know what they've gotten themselves into and they know that they can't get out of it and they just deal with the consequences. Um, how many people, every time you decide you want to stop using an app that you um, had on your phone, you just delete the app? Do you ever just, you just delete the app? Do you ever like close your account first and then delete the app? No. A couple of people. Thank you. Good. Good practice. Um, yeah, we found that even faced with bad information about a company, people will still continue to use the product. They might assume, oh, well, they're going to be better now because they got a spanking, right? Um, and it doesn't happen. Well, sometimes it happens. Um, if something really bad happens, they'll close their account, but they won't necessarily close their account. They might just refuse to use it. Um, so the safe tech specification, basically what we're doing is we're mapping these kind of human relationship verbs, I guess, eavesdropping, gossip, manipulation, and we're mapping them to actions that we can take as um, organizations in our product development. So we're going to try to reduce the amount of data that we need. So if you have a newsletter, what are you going to ask for? The email, right? Um, and then we're going to give our, um, our users a little bit more control. Um, and the app stores are doing this with their privacy um, information. When you go into the app store, you can usually tell. Um, and again, it's a lot of it self-reported by the app producers. Um, so you have to like, you know, balance that a little bit. Um, and then also making sure that our defaults are respectful so that, you know, no opt-in is like a really big deal. Um, and it took a lot of frustra frustration to find all of those opt-ins, um, you know, in order to comply with GDPR. Um, but it was done, so it's possible. Um, and so you can think about it as a, as a creator. Are you spying on your users in any way that you don't really need to? Um, are you, um, is, is the information a legitimate use or is it a legitimate use that's not really that legitimate? Um, just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean that you need to do it. Are you gathering more than you need just because you can? Um, or are you using actions to force users who wouldn't ordinarily give up that information? Um, and then when we make promises about what we're going to do with the data, do you keep it? Or do you just sell your company and say, well, now it's up to them to decide to keep that promise or not? Um, when we were developing the specification, I kind of like to call us the Justice League. Um, we had data analytics. That was Aquaman. He's swimming in the data, right? Um, we had Batman, the legal enforcer, right? Um, security, Superman, he's strong. Um, and then I was Wonder Woman on the top. I was involved in product integrity. And it was basically making sure that all of the policies that underlie data, legal, and security are actually realized and communicated out to the user. Um, we created a safe technology audit. And I, um, basically, everybody had a part in the audit. So there's like different requirements that you have to go through to make sure that you meet the safe technology. Um, and, uh, <coughs> you know, we, we described what kinds of things should be uh, clear to the user. The use of cookies should be clear. Consent for any kind of information um, should be clear. Um, you shouldn't force an account before you provide information. Um, people should be able to see what the site is about and what, what they can get from it before they make uh, that information. Uh, that decision. 
Um, you should reduce the amount of information you need to create an account. Um, and, uh, you know, some other things. Uh, there, there were other, you know, items that, that go, you know, very deep into the design. <coughs> we also created a testing rubric, um, which is going to look really familiar. It's, it's kind of like using the UX expert um, testing um, in order to understand which digital harm is an issue and how the patterns that we're creating, the UI patterns, are supporting it um, so that we can prevent, um, you know, so that we can ensure that people are actually being able to use the product without um, fear and, and to be able to trust you so that you can maintain that consumer product relationship. Um, and so for each item in that testing rubric, we have some, um, you know, uh, categories of things that we check. So whether things are, the individual is able to control, um, whether there's no forced um, continuity, um, and that there is no deterioration of trust. And a lot of these actually do map to business um, benefits, like re reduced customer service calls, um, you know, less selling to people to re-up their account because they trust you. <coughs> and um, this is just a description of the um, integrity testing that I was doing. And again, it follows that kind of UX expert heuristics test um, where you describe the findings, you give the evidence for the finding, um, you talk about how the user is experiencing it, um, and then give your recommendations and the kinds of impacts that happen um, when you correct those problems. Um, and I added in a couple of heuristics. I wanted to identify if there is an IA um, information architecture heuristic that is being, um, that's at play. And these are based at, on Abby Covert's um, IA heuristics. Um, you can find those at abbycovert.com. Um, and also the, print, uh, the um, Purdue uh, Design Pattern Lab, um, which also sub subcategorizes them. Um, and then we also came up with a severity scale for how bad the problem is, and that all rolled up to a score that the um, product is going to have. Um, so if you want to play, um, there's a lot of easy ways to get involved. Um, the Internet Sta Safety Lab operates kind of like a mini W3C. We have a working group for safe technology um, that anybody can join. So if you're interested, it's at internetsafetylabs.org. Um, and uh, you can also read some of the research that we've done, um, including some research on uh, school age um, applications that have a lot of data sharing um, beyond what US law re uh, allows. Um, that we're starting to work with, um, we're, we're starting to work with individual school districts to get their apps cleaned up so that they're not in violation of FERPA um, or COPPA, which is the Child's Online Privacy Act. Um, and you can also look up our um, Digital Harms Dictionary. You can contribute to the Good Tech Wiki. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you. We have lunch now.